The League of Women Voters is a trusted, nonpartisan organization made up of women and men volunteer members that works to help citizens to make informed choices in elections. While we do not endorse any candidates or political party, we are directly involved in presenting the important issues to keep our community strong, and we give voters the information they need to make informed election decisions. If you are interested in becoming a League member, joining with us to inform and engage Portland citizens, our membership form is on our website at lwvpdx.org and also in the back of the room. Today's forum is the last of four we are presenting before the November 6th general election. We have held a forum for State Ballot Measure 79 and 84, a forum for Portland City Commissioner candidates, and a ballot measure forum to consider local ballot measures for Portland and Monoma County. All four forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website, lwvpdx.org on and some before October 12th. The forums will also be played back on local access cable TV. The playback schedule is posted on our website. Now for some other election tools you can use that are available now. Voters can also look to our nonpartisan voters guide to read answers to questions posed to all candidates as well as nonpartisan presentations of ballot measures. The Voter's Guide is available both on our website, lwvpdx.org, and in print form. You will find free print copies at Multnomah County Library branches and in the Multnomah County Elections Office. Another election tool is Vote411.org. Vote411.org streamlines your ballot research so you receive information about only the candidates and measures that will appear on your ballot. Go to vote411.org and enter your street address and the voter's guide information for only those items on your ballot will appear. Finally, if you have not yet registered to vote, the deadline is October 16th. You will need to register if you have moved since you last voted, changed your name, changed your political party, or have never registered to vote in Oregon. You can register here at the forum See the League member with a yellow regis register to vote pin and a clipboard. You can also find registration forms at election offices, post offices, Department of Motor Vehicle offices, or you can register online through the Oregon Secretary of State's website. Our sponsor for taping the forum this afternoon is Multnomah Bar Foundation. We thank the Multnomah Bar Foundation for its generous support, which allows us to record our forums so that voters can view them at home and at their convenience. Now, let me introduce our moderator, Professor Barbara Dudley. Barbara is adjunct professor, Hatfield School of Government, Portland State University, and a member of the League of Women Voters. Barbara, I turn the forum over to you. Thank you, Mary. Um, first, let me introduce our candidates for mayor, Jefferson Smith and Charlie Hales. The topic for this afternoon's forum is how to govern Portland so as to achieve both equity and opportunity for all of our residents. We'll divide the forum into three parts. At the beginning of each segment, I will ask the candidates a question. They'll have two minutes to respond, and I will address follow-up questions to each candidate. So let us begin. Um, and thank you both for coming to yet another forum, of which you have been to many. Um, the first question is about equity, and we would like you to describe how the budgets of the city and the Portland Development Commission can be expended to benefit all of Portland's residents. So Jefferson Smith, you respond first for two minutes, and then Charlie Hales. Thanks for having us, and honored to be with League of Women Voters. My experience with this organization officially, professionally, has been for at least the last 10 years, uh, including uh, working with this organization on voter education and voter registration drives, and I appreciate your work and your attendance. 
There are several things, and I know we'll have a chance to discuss more of them. I'll address a few to start. One, we need to be more disciplined with urban renewal areas generally. For the last 20 years, we've continued to expand the sections of the city that are subject to urban renewal and shrinking the percentage of resources that go to basic services across the city. So we have to shift that 20-year habit. Second, we have to think about how we're spending that money. One... Uh, I hesitate to call it experiment, but one newer move of trying to use the urban renewal tool in smaller ways with greater community connectivity, as with the Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative, offers us some hope, I think, because it has greater likelihood of having urban renewal not just being urban removal, of actually having communities connect with investments rather than just big investments that the city has been doing and then pushing people out to East Portland as we have been for the last 20 or 30 years. A third, we need to be applauding the mayor for starting the budget mapping exercise so we can see where resources are going. Uh, in the last, 27% of the population is living east of 82nd Avenue. According to the Tribune, in the last round of stimulus funding, only 1.5% of the stimulus dollars were spent there, only 3.3% of the transportation dollars. When $11 million were spent in subsidized loans, zero for oh, 15 seconds, we need to be now taking that mapping exercise and moving it to a budget and strategy exercise to make sure our values are reflected by our budget choices. There are also things we need to do about shifting economic development and our education resources. Thank you. Charlie Hales. Thank you. Well, let me start with how I first was really awakened about these issues. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. in a mostly white suburb, went to a good public school system and didn't understand the problems facing people of color. Then I had a construction job. I put myself through college with construction jobs and I worked with a guy named Elwood Samuels. And every payday, every two weeks, I would see him after work at the building supply house buying 200 bricks and a bag of mortar. And I finally asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you week after week buying 200 bricks and a bag of mortar? And he said, I'm building a house, Charlie. And I said, why are you building it that way? And he said, there's no way that a black man is going to get a loan for a house in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And the light went on over my head. And I've remembered it ever since. And I think about Elwood when I think about housing issues even now. And I care about these issues. And that's why people like Avel Gordley and Pauline Bradford and, and uh, Tak Nguyen and Shelley Romero and a lot of other leaders of color in the city are helping me with this campaign because we've got to turn caring into action. And what I hear from them more and more is that they want to turn from talk to action, and that's my forte. So let me talk about the Fire Bureau for a minute to prove that that action can, is possible. I changed that bureau from all white men, essentially, to what it is today. And now we need to do that with how we budget. First, I'll assign all the city bureau budgets to myself for the first three months, and we'll act like a board of directors instead of five lords of our own turf when we do the city budget. And we'll think about equity, and we'll think about the whole city, and we'll not just think about our bureaus when the five of us as a city council act on that budget. Secondly, the Portland Development Commission does need to turn from sequestering more and more of the city and urban renewal districts to smaller, more focused areas like the one underway at 122nd and Division, where we can and make sure that we are being equitable, which means doing more about the inequities of the past than we have been so far. Um, both of you mentioned, well, let me just first say, I'm going to be asking you um, follow-up questions, and you should limit your answers to a minute and a half. Um, and do focus on the future, um, what you will do as mayor. Um, you both mentioned urban renewal, and uh, the question I want you to elaborate on is, the um, question of gentrification that is often the flip side of urban renewal. How explicitly, how can the city avoid that problem? Uh, Charlie, first. You go first. Um, first, learn what, from what went wrong in previous urban renewal efforts, and then do things differently going forward. One, focus more on capacity building and improvement for the businesses that are already there. So a larger commitment to the PDC storefront loan program, uh, access to credit. I've proposed something on my website, you can look it up, charliehales.com, called Community Credit Portland, where we use the money that the city banks 
to leverage loans for local small businesses. Not an original idea. They've been doing it in that wild and crazy place, North Dakota, since 1917 with the State Bank of North Dakota. Um, then a, a buy local, buy Oregon policy favoring local small businesses. And then in housing, using the land trust model that Proud Ground is trying out in a couple of places in the city to give people access to very low cost home ownership. So have a toolkit in place that is about neighborhood improvement, not about neighborhood replacement. And again, as I mentioned earlier, focus on some smaller areas like 122nd and Division rather than a huge corridor like the interstate corridor is today. Thank you. Um, Jefferson. We've got to make sure we maximize the tools that we have. And first of all, I want to make sure we're talking about gentrification and not just sort of community investment generally. How do we actually avoid displacement as we work for neighborhood improvement? And the reality of the answer is we won't always. As we look to address crime in neighborhoods, as we look to add green space to neighborhoods, as we look to improve neighborhoods, rents are going to go up and housing values are going to go up. And how do you address that? And it's hard. One, we've got to make sure we use and preserve the 30% set aside for public and affordable housing. Second, we should lobby the legislature on something the Home Builders Association did to the state that was a tragedy, which was to create a statewide ban on inclusionary zoning, meaning that our city does not have the tool that most major cities have, which is to allow when there is an investment in our town that is required to have some percentage of affordable and public housing. And we should lobby the legislature to remove that ban. We should applaud and work more towards community benefits agreements, making sure when we are doing procurement that we are helping neighborhood members get the jobs, recognizing that renters need jobs. We also need to have, uh, we should consider Tony Fuentes' proposal. He's the CEO, he's the head of Milagros Boutique. They're very small. I don't know if he calls himself a CEO. I think they have three employees. Uh, and which is saying, just as we have a set aside for affordable housing, when we're making commercial investments with urban renewal dollars, we should do a similar thing with commercial dollars, making sure those are not just giveaways, but that we're targeting our subsidies towards allowing people to stay in their communities and doing some means testing for that. Thank you. Um, and now, um, moving on to other issues. Jefferson first, the Portland's far east side suffers from a disproportionate lack of infrastructure and transportation options. How do we remedy that problem given the city's and TriMet's budget woes? It's gonna be hard and we won't undo what's been done over the last 30 years and the next four. Uh, and I'm glad the question is coming up and that we're focusing attention because it's gonna take the whole city. Let's say, let's talk about a few things. One. We need to be looking at some catalytic investments. One of the reasons I like the Gateway Education Center proposal is it could be that. We have a marvelous uh, intersection of transit options. If we could make sure that's not just an Oregon clinic, but also something that could be catalytic for the community, that'd be good. And not only for businesses that require commutes, but also for businesses that will serve local neighbors, including having an industrial kitchen that people who make tamales and sell them at farmers markets can access and live up to code, having tool libraries so people who want to do uh, light scale manufacturing have access to tools they might not themselves afford. So we've got to look at a job strategy that fits East Portland. Second, we need to look at education. That Another thing that the Home Builders Association did or didn't do was when they passed the systems development charge legislation, they specifically excluded schools from the list that was uh, allowed to be funded by SDCs, meaning that developers could push in a bunch of housing, and sometimes that's good, but not pay anything for schools. We've got to figure out tools to fund those schools. Third, we've got to look at not a streetcar down Foster Powell, but bus rapid transit, and look at how we can expand bus service. We spent about three and a half million dollars on streetcar operations. I don't hate the streetcar, but it's simultaneous with us reducing bus service. We've also then got to look at how we can make shorter trips, do more placemaking in East Portland, which we haven't done very well for the last 30 years so that people don't have to commute long distances and allowing for some more bicycle and, and uh, walking. Thank you. Um, Charlie Hale. Well, the first thing we have to do in transportation, 
not just for East Portland, but for the whole city, is to focus on basic services and make sure that we're taking care of the streets that we have. And in fact, we've fallen behind on that score. When I was city commissioner in charge of transportation, we repaved more miles of streets every year than we do now, and we did it with half the budget. And so the first thing we can do is be good stewards of what we have. And everybody, no matter whether you're on a bike or riding a bus or driving your own car, needs you know, a well-maintained street system. And in fact, we have to repave about 100 miles a year just to stay even. And the current budget proposal, I believe, is 30 miles. So we're going backwards. So first, do our job, take care of what we have. And then secondly, after we've done that, make sure the public knows where the balance of those funds are going, because I think there are a lot of citizens who simply fear that the city's spending every last dime on bike lanes. That's not true, but it's understandable given the lack of maintenance that people are concerned. And then we're going to need to find additional revenue, state, regional, federal, local, in order to get on with it. And I want to have a capital improvements program that starts chipping away at that 60 miles of unbuilt streets and similar number of unbuilt sidewalks. And I agree with Jeff, it's not going to get done in anyone's four-year term, but we'll make the commitment to start doing, say, three miles a year, and in 20 years it will be done. But we have not made that commitment, and again, the current administration has been going backwards and just maintaining the streets that we have. TriMet, another story, I'll help with their fiscal woes because we need them to be an effective partner. I would love to go into that further, but I'm going to move on to the question of Homelessness. Um, despite the many efforts to address the issue, the city's homeless population is not shrinking, and the tension with downtown business owners persists. So how would you, as mayor and on the city council, address this tension and balance it against the rights and the needs of the homeless? Um, Charlie Hales, you start this one. Well, first, you're right that the problem is growing. There'll be 1,700 people sleeping outside tonight by the current estimates of those that deal with these problems firsthand. I was talking to some of those folks the other day when I was serving breakfast on a Friday morning at New Avenues for Youth, which deals with young people who are homeless. And they said, the staff there said, uh, there are more kids and they have worse problems of drug and alcohol addiction, uh, falling through the foster care system, or even mental health problems. And there are more of them with worse problems, and that the current sidewalk management ordinance that the city has isn't doing anyone, including those kids, any good. And I was frankly kind of surprised to hear those two perspectives put together in that way. But I think they've got it right, which is that we need more services through these amazing nonprofits that do the work, assisted by city and county government, uh, to make sure that we have housing options and treatment and uh, a place for police officers to take someone wandering the streets suffering from mental illness where they can go. We don't have that facility today. We should have it. Uh, and then we also need an effective sidewalk management ordinance that allows the police or the clean and safe officers to be able to say, I have services for you, but you can't stay here in front of McDonald's with your dogs at 6th and Main all day and all night, day after day. And they can't say that now. And in order for us to have that level of civility on the sidewalks, we've got to have services. Because this is Portland. We're not just going to get out the billy club and say, move along. Jefferson. Uh, what I'd add is a commitment to seeing the whole picture and a commitment to trying humble innovation. And by that, I mean generally building off the good things, trying to prove the good things that we know about. This is a moral crisis, and I hesitate to go any further without acknowledging that and acknowledging also that every elected official who faces this has and will, in an important way, fail. And that is one of the worst things about running for mayor, is knowing that in some of your most important moral responsibilities, you'll fail. What I'll try to do is fail better. How do I think we can do that? One, seeing the whole picture. That includes regional solutions. So right now, uh, I was told by the city that, uh, and we haven't been able to check up uh, on the numbers, but that of the discretionary city dollars that are spent on homeless services, 80% of them come from Portland, while that, that's only 40% of the population. Now, it's not accurate that uh, we are attracting people experiencing homelessness from all around the country because we're so friendly and liberal. Uh, 
It is accurate that we are addressing a greater share of the population than our regional partners, than, than Washington County and Clark County particularly. So we've got to make sure we ask them to pay more of their freight as well to have regional solutions. Second, we also need to make sure not just in terms of treatment and not just in terms of housing, but also in terms of employment, wraparound services. If you do only one of those three, you might do zero. Ask me another time about Keep the Change Weekend. <laughs> Our next segment, which we have to move on to, is about opportunity, and it's about opportunity for all of Portland's residents. And what we want you to do is to describe what city leaders can realistically do to benefit the economic position of all of those who live in Portland, given the current national and global economic climate. Um, not an easy task, not an easy question. Charlie Hales, you get two minutes to begin. Okay. Um, well, first, as you probably know, Barbara, there was a study just recently published by Portland State, uh, Jason Jurjevich and others, that studied this question of do young people come here to retire? And it turns out they don't. They come here to find opportunity, but they'll only stay so long until that opportunity is realized. Uh, and there was this uh, wonderful quote from a young woman at a women's leadership conference last week where she said she wants Portland to be an extraordinary place where an extraordinary, extraordinary citizens do extraordinary things. And I think that's a hopeful vision of what our climate of opportunity ought to be. What can we do as a city, and what can I do as your next mayor if that's the job I get? Uh, there's a long list of things. First, access to capital, like I mentioned. Use the city's money to leverage loans for small businesses. It's a radical idea, but 95 years of testing in North Dakota, I think we should give it a shot. Expand the seed fund, uh, the Portland Seed Fund that helps new businesses start up and get going, particularly technology firms. Have a stronger buy Oregon, buy local policy. Be involved in the Greater Portland, Inc. regional effort to grow the regional economy. Re-examine the clusters that the Portland, of Development, Portland Development Commission is focusing on. Right now, they're focusing on athletics, on clean tech, on advanced manufacturing and software. Fine. What about food? We should have a food cluster. We're in the Willamette Valley. We have all these value-added food industries. So expand that list of targeted industries. Look at our costs. If you want to move from a food cart to a storefront restaurant, you're going to pay thirty to fifty thousand dollars in city fees. Not surprisingly, it doesn't happen often enough. Look at our basic services, the cost of water, because it's a big thing for small business. And finally, most of all, coordination with education. We need a great public school in every neighborhood, a clear connection from school to work, and more of the kinds of programs we see at Jefferson where kids get college credit and get launched into their career while they're still in high school. Thank you. Jefferson Smith. I think the government's role in economic development is essentially fourfold. I think we can help with workforce and education. I think we can help with infrastructure. I think we can help with just making government work and people navigate the uh, realm of the public thing. And I think we can catalyze things. And I'll say just a little bit about each. In terms of job training and workforce development, this should be a focus. I won't run the schools, but one of the top priorities we've had since the beginning of this campaign is what we're calling Portland Summers, recognizing if we can leverage the summer gap, which is one of the biggest drivers in the achievement gap, not only to reduce that gap, but also to leverage more partners in things, you know, folks like Manufacturing 21 who are ready to expand the number of internship and employment opportunities, facilities like Ace Academy and Benson trying to expand the opportunities for people to learn skills and young people to learn skills and for existing workers to receive retraining. Uh, we've got to do that. Second, we've got to rethink infrastructure. There's been the economic development conversation in this campaign, and I don't mean by the candidates, I mean by most of the people who are lobbying us, are a Columbia River Crossing, a casino, a convention center hotel, coal trains coming through the city, all right? It's a lousy plan, and it doesn't fit Portland, and it doesn't fit this century. So we've got to rethink infrastructure investments. We've got to apply a different portion of our brain, a different portion of our heart, and compete based on our distinctive strengths, not just trying to be Phoenix with worse weather. So we've got to think about what those things might be, from retrofitting public buildings for energy efficiency, to broadband deployment, to getting money out of the Pentagon, to cleaning up the Willamette River, to also how we can catalyze homegrown businesses. And I'll start talking slightly more slowly. If we think about, for instance, a video game industry, which we don't have, but we do have artists, we do have comic book 
denizens. We do have uh, a burgeoning tech industry, and I think we could start that from zero to 60, and that could be a future area where we compete. We also need to compete in the areas where we're already strong. He mentioned some of the clusters. How do we actually do that catalyzation? I like the idea, but I'm concerned about the specifics of Community Credit Portland because we're not FDIC insured, so we want to make sure what that fund actually looks like. She's asking me to stop. I'd like to go on. <laughs> um, I might actually give you both an opportunity to expand and go on um, because I want to twist this a little bit when you both use the word catalyze. Um, but how do you ensure that in the process of catalyzing or attracting potential employers to Portland or helping nurture new businesses that you're not giving away the store in terms of tax breaks, waivers of land use or environmental regulations, the need to pay living wages, et cetera? So catalyzing can, can go a lot of different ways. Um, I think I'm going to go back to Charlie Hales and let him answer that and then come back to you, Jefferson, just so I'm going back and forth some. Yeah, I think Portlanders are rightly wary of cutting sweet deals in order to get economic growth. We haven't had to do that. We don't have to sell this place short. Doesn't mean we don't look to our costs and that we don't occasionally provide incentives uh, to, to local businesses to grow. I've, for example, I've proposed that we ought to give a a 50% discount on our city county business income tax to B corporations that are socially responsible corporations that take on a lot of community costs by going beyond what most employers do. The community gets something in exchange for us foregoing some tax revenue, but those should be very limited. You mentioned some things, uh, setting aside our land use regulations. No, we shouldn't, and that's why we adopt them as a comprehensive plan and then enforce them with a code. And in fact, I've had a lot to do with making our regulations tougher, like banning uh, gated communities like they have all over California. Uh, so I don't think we have to sell ourselves short on the land use side. Um, community benefit agreements, if we're giving any benefits to a, a, a company to come here or grow here, we should make sure that they are family wage jobs and that that's the future for this city is to regrow the middle class with unions and family wage jobs for more of our citizens. So I don't think we have to sell ourselves short. We need to look to our costs and be a good partner, but not go crazy with incentives. Jefferson. Your question is the whole deal. All right, your question is, and I don't mean to pander, Barbara, I apologize, but your question is, to me, the tied for the biggest question facing how we address the economy in this country. I sit on the House Transportation and Economic Development Committee. The lion's share of proposals that come across the desk are arguable boondoggles and tax breaks. That is essentially the tools we have been using for economic development. Uh, I know we're supposed to talk about the future. I'll say that in the future, I will continue to do what I've done in the past, which is be and try to be a real hawk on tax breaks. So what do we do instead? Well, that's why we've been focusing on not just economic hunting, but economic gardening, on expanding CEO mentorship, which you can do with volunteer CEOs. You can't afford them, but you can get a bunch of them for free with trying to do better circulation of local capital. The next question for the seed fund is how do we ensure a return on investment? It's one thing if we're giving a little bit of money, but if it becomes a significant investment for early stage businesses and, the only, and our only hope for return is tax dollars down the road, it starts looking like a giveaway pretty quick. I'm a big fan of the seed fund, but we've got to think about the entity we can create that spins off money either for, either for education or other critical services so it has a guaranteed benefit for the people and not just for the people receiving the investment. The third is enhanced advanced business intelligence and market research information. Not just tax breaks or a big bridge, but helping early stage businesses find new customers and new markets. A very quick example. A company like Indo Windows, they make a window insert. They want access to GIS mapping so they can figure out where to apply their sales force before next winter. PSU and partners can help with that kind of thing without any tax breaks. I'm going to allow for some continuation of this conversation for a moment, but I want you to add in a conversation about whether or not you think business and development taxes and fees as they exist right now are too high, too low, or just right for this um, catalyzing process that we're talking about. Um, and back to you, Charlie, for a minute and a half. I think 
our tax structure in Oregon is not a thing of beauty, and the governor doesn't think so either, which is why he wants to take that on here in his administration of looking at our state tax structure and asking the big questions about, is this really the right tax structure for the next 50 years, to pay for public services and to spread the burden in a responsible and equitable way? And I want to be a partner in that difficult conversation. It does open up what uh, a former county commissioner here once called Pandora's can of worms. Uh, it's a difficult set of issues, but I'm glad he wants to do it and I want to help. Um, when it comes to taxes, I think the city county business income tax, which is the, the, the local tax on business, is a modest burden and doesn't really change the business climate. You hear some complaining about it, but I think in general it's below the pain threshold of what makes people decide to grow or not grow here costs of permits, and particularly what are called systems development charges, are a problem in the city of Portland right now. Uh, Cinema 21 is planning to expand their theater into an adjacent empty real estate office. They're going to pay $61,000 in transportation systems development charges alone. Now, they might be able to pay that, but the next business down the street might say, as many of them do, as they say in New Jersey, forget about it. We're not going to do it. And if we have fees that are stopping people from growing, then we need to pay attention. And I want to review those fees and reconsider them and make sure that we're collecting what we need, but not scaring away our own customers. Yeah, this is one of the primary differences in the race. We're both pro-choice. We both believe in marriage equality. On instincts where it comes to economic development and progressivity, not only socially but economically, this is where our differences tend to lie. Uh, my first move on statewide tax policy is not making it more aggressive. I, I am loath to make that a top priority. In terms of how we catalyze things, the reason we're pushing the economic gardening stuff is I don't want to move first to fee breaks for developers. I think we do want developers to internalize costs. I think this is a good place to build. I think this is a marvelous, marvelous place to be able to own things and operate things. I am bullish on the future of Portland, and I think that's going to be true for investors going forward. I don't think I'm going to have to bribe them. What I'm going to have to do is make sure that the cost, not the price, not just the fees, but making sure that how we spend our money, we spend smartly. If we're doing dumb stuff, if we can improve permitting, not only how much it costs, not just what its price is, but actually how much we're spending to do it in human time and city dollars, we've got to do that. We've got to make it better. If we can, by having a single 311 system for all non-emergency government phone calls, we can save some money and make government easier to access, we've got to do that. If we can resist federal requirements so we don't have to raise people's water rates unless they really are needed to be raised, then we've got to do that. But We've also got to make sure that we're internalizing costs. I think systems development charges, development impact fees, are one of the most important kinds of fees that we have. And it's one of the differences in the race. I want to turn your attention for a minute and a half each um, to the question of public sector jobs, which I think get overlooked in this job creation question. Mm. Um, we see a lot of pressure when we look at the city's budget to cut public sector jobs, to reduce hours, to convert permanent jobs to temporary jobs, to cut or eliminate benefits. So what is your response to that? Um, yes, uh, Jefferson, you start. So I agree with the sentiment underlying the question. I've tried to be really disciplined over the last four years. I may have let it slip once or twice. But I try to be really, really careful not to repeat the talking point of private sector job growth. Not because I don't think it's really important. It is really important. But there's a reason that it exists. And the reason that it exists is so that instead of talking about overall employment, and if we just talk about private sector job growth, then we can eviscerate public services, we can gash education, we can lower taxes on wealthy folks, and still say, oh, but that, all of that job loss doesn't count. The only job loss that counts is if it's happening to Intel and Boeing and Nike, not if it's happening to teachers and firefighters and police officers. And it's one of the biggest changes we've got to make in the public conversation. And even in this campaign, and I think three forums ago we've done a lot, the question I got from Charlie was, what have you done for private sector job growth in District 47? And there are a couple things that we tried. 
But one of the bigger things we did was I'm the only candidate in this race who supported the last, state, the last round of statewide revenue measures that actually supported public services, which kept a bunch of teachers from getting fired, which kept a bunch of public workers from getting set aside, and kept a bunch of people receiving those services, which is also important. So we've got to change how we talk about it. We've got to make sure we're willing to invest in public services, and we've got to make sure that when we're thinking about economic development, we're seeing that whole picture. Charlie Hales. Well, first, the main reason we have less teachers and we have classrooms with 30 or 35 kids in each one is that the legislature, Jeff, where you serve, has failed to hold its bargain of keeping the state budget commitment to public education. And it's faded from 43% of the state budget down to 39. And that difference is $30 million a year to Portland Public Schools. So the legislature, and, and if I'm your mayor, our number one legislative priority will be going to the next legislative session and saying, make your commitment to schools first and hold that commitment until such time as the governor's revenue restructuring effort changes our tax system. But that's job one for the state legislature, and they've fallen short. Now, when it comes to public employment in general in the city, we need more people doing real work of basic services. We need more people paving streets. We need more people maintaining parks. But the problem in the city budget over the last few years is the current council has cut those basic services and by and large kept over head and administration harmless. So now we're at a six to one ratio of people that perform public services that the public wants to overhead and administration, like mayor staff. So that's the big opportunity in the city budget, and the city auditors pointed it out, get from a six to one ratio of workers to managers to something like 10 to one, and then the dollars that we have will be paying public employees to pave streets, mow grass, teach kids how to swim, and drive police cars. Um, let me just ask you uh, somewhat of a follow-up question on the um, public sector, which is what do you see as the role of unions in the public sector, and how do you view your role as mayor in dealing with the unions and union negotiations? And um, Charlie, I think you start this one. Public sector unions have a role in the process, which is to look out for their members and to make sure that the city's being, a city or any other public employer is being a responsible employer. And so I'm, I'm very happy with the collective bargaining process. I have some support from both public and private sector unions in my campaign. But um, that you also have to understand there are going to be times when there are tensions in that relationship and that the forces of the status quo sometimes don't allow us to make the changes that we should make. I had to deal with this with the Fire Bureau when we added women and minorities to the staff of the Fire Bureau for the first time with the, uh, with the trainee program that I created. That was opposed by the Firefighters Union, and now they're now supporting my opponent. Um, we have changes ahead in the Police Bureau that will require some difficult negotiations, like the 48-hour rule that prohibits the Police Bureau from interviewing an officer until after 48 hours when there's been an officer involved shooting. We need to bargain that issue at the, uh, at the bargaining table next year when the police contract comes up. In my case, you know that I'm willing to take those things on. I'm not looking for a fight, but there will be creative tension, let's say, between the interests of the union and trying to keep the status quo and the changes that we have to make. So be it. That's why we have bargaining. Thank you. Uh, Jefferson. So generally, I think that unions and collective bargaining are critical if in the biggest picture, we're going to address what this country is facing, which is the biggest wealth disparities since before World War II. And all, if we don't address that in the next 50 years in this country, all this chatter we're having today is not much more than chatter. It will be very hard to address public safety or homelessness or real job opportunity or just about any other thing if we don't address that. And I didn't grow up in a union. It, it was not how I got into politics. It has never been viewed as my sort of core base of support. But in but the, the mathematician and strategist in me can't do the math or the strategy to a real middle class economy in this country without organized labor unions. Now. My role as mayor is fiduciary for the city, not fiduciary just for workers, not fiduciary just for managers, not fiduciary just for any city bureau, but for the whole city. And in negotiations, I'm the other, on the other side of the negotiating table, and I try to be pretty careful with other people's money. And I was the only candidate in this race who finished the primary without any debt, and I try to be really careful with other people's money, and will be. 
Also, I think the role of the mayor can be nudging, uh, and sometimes it's a tug and sometimes it's a nudge and sometimes it's a little more, to urge for cultural change within institutions. I hear a different report on the Fire Bureau, and we don't need to get into that too deeply. But what I would say is that if we can help our union partners recognize it is in their interest for self-preservation to make government services excellent, then I think we can move into this century a little bit better. I've had those conversations over the last 10 years. I can talk about some of the things we've been talking about if you ask about it another time. Okay, but we're moving on to our last segment now. Um, and Secret. perhaps it figures into that. Uh, that's up to you. Each of you will be asked to spend a couple of minutes to give us your assessment of your own personal character and leadership abilities, not each other's, but your own, your strengths and weaknesses in relationship to colleagues, to staff, and to the public. So again, character and leadership abilities. Um, and we begin this segment with Jefferson Smith. Two minutes. I'll start with weaknesses. Uh, some of those, some of, the, some of the manifestations of those have been subject of greater chatter in this campaign than any policy issue facing the city. Uh, I am a better driver than rumored, but not a great one. Uh, the, uh, my whole life, there have been basic tasks that have taken me more energy. Uh, I am, uh, it takes me, it takes me energy to, um, to focus. Uh, and uh, those are some of my weaknesses. Another weakness is I'm very hard on myself and I can be hard on other people. Uh, I can be hard on my staff. Uh, the, some of my strengths, I try to be candid about my own weaknesses. Uh, and I don't only mean in the political sense of owning up to them. I mean, I try to be honest with myself so I can address them. And it's how I went from being a kid who uh, might never have graduated high school, was a prediction of some of my early teachers, to somebody who graduated near the top of my class at Harvard Law School. That's how I started and ran a successful nonprofit organization that went from having high staff turnover because we couldn't afford to pay anybody to having one of the longest average tenure of senior staff of any advocacy nonprofit in our state. Uh, it's how I was the only member of my uh, legislative class, I think, to be elected and reelected by my colleagues to House leadership and I think one of two members of the House on the Governor's Steering Committee. I process information very well. Uh, I listen surprisingly well. I work harder than most people you know. Uh, we've done 204 neighborhood house parties. We've knocked on 70,000 doors. We've gathered 3,800 individual donors. Those are historic numbers in this city, and they are growing. Uh, and I care more than most people I know. And hopefully with being honest with myself and working hard and caring, my strengths vastly outweigh my weaknesses. Thank you. In this segment, I'm going to do follow-up questions with you, Jefferson, sure. for a few minutes and then turn to Charlie and let him have his time. So I want to um, go back to um, the discussion that, that you said we've heard more of than of any substantive issues yep. um, about your weaknesses that you characterize as an energy, uh, that it takes energy for me to focus. Um, and that is seen, I think, as a lack of attention to detail. Mm -hmm. um, and there are voters who worry that mm -hmm. this lack of attention to detail will affect your ability to serve competently as mayor, mm -hmm. particularly given our, our um, city government system. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to those voters? Anybody who knows me does not bear the critique that I fail to attend to detail. Uh, my ability to zoom from general to specific, back and forth frictionlessly, keep facts in my head and think about how those things link together. Let me just say, because I've been beat on a little bit, better than just about anybody you ever met. Uh, I remember details. I care about them a lot. In fact, one of the reasons we were able to build brick by brick a nonprofit organization from nothing, and there's not many people in this state who've done that without getting any government money, was because we attended a lot to detail. The reason we were able to be within 5% of every budget projection every year was because we really attended to detail. Every dollar we spent, every person we hired. We made some mistakes along the way for sure. We started out as an all-volunteer organization. But in fact, one of the ways I've tried to improve as a leader is not to fixate too much on the micro details of somebody else's job 
job and instead set objectives and goals for an organization and for staff and evaluate them based on their ability to succeed towards those goals and objectives. So my weakness with respect to detail has not been an underattention during my professional career. Uh, so that's how I'd answer the question as you asked it. But how does that explain not paying your bar dues or taking care of license suspensions? So the uh, different things. I am lousy at the, and I have been lousy as I've been spending uh, energy in my professional life. I've been lousy attending a lot of details in my own personal life. Not because I don't understand the details, not because I can't see forests from trees, but because I underprioritized it. I got fat. I got up to 250 pounds. I used to be an athletic, good-looking guy. Uh, and the, uh, that uh, in terms of my driving record, let's be clear, although it was, again, covered, I think, more than any other issue in the campaign, I have received, I'm going to avoid the stop because you know, I got asked the question. I'm not going to let the question linger. Uh, the, uh, I think I've had two suspensions in the last, I've had one suspension and two moving violations in the last eight years. Uh, so the rumors of my embarrassing driving record are particularly embarrassing during my college and years in my 20s when it was really bad. But I'm not 20 anymore. Uh, I've never been disciplined by the Bar Association. The, uh, the fact that that was a story is interesting. It's a club membership for a club that I don't use to practice law. Uh, and yeah, during the transition of bill pay during my marriage, you know, we, uh, uh, we have uh, had some discussions there. But nothing that has kept me from being able to focus on my work and do a good job and work very hard. Um, let me move you on to your relationship with staff. Um, how would you describe your working relationship with staff? Uh, well, you should ask them, but I'll give you a list. Uh, the, uh, no, no. We, this, is a place, this is a place where I think I have grown and improved a lot. I always had some strengths there uh, in being able to identify talented people and recruit them. Uh, one of the areas where I needed to improve and still need to improve, but have gotten pretty good, is in in nurturing, and the and I'm still not as nurturing as I should be, but I try to recognize good staff and do what is necessary to keep them. Uh, I'm a demanding boss. I'm going to continue to be. I'm going to look over at you guys when I say that. Uh, the uh, I get more out of people than most people. I get more out of myself than most people get out of themselves, and I'm going to continue to do that. What I try to do is then balance that with a little extra dose of love, with a little extra dose of lo loyalty, with a little extra dose of appreciation. I don't always do that perfectly, but I try. It's one of the reasons why the person who's running the bus project now is somebody I've known for 10 years and somebody who worked for the organization for multiple years and is still sticking with it. It's why the people you see over there, Lucy Palmersheim has been with me for six years. Henry Kramer has been uh, with me in one capacity for another for, I think, five. Uh, Brian Little, had, we met a year and three weeks ago, but he has been with me from the day he was there. And this guy here I just met like two weeks ago, and he's an intern. I think you're great. Uh, the, uh, that in terms of duration of the staff we work with, it bears out that that portion of leadership in the city, we will do extraordinarily well. Um, one last question that I'd like you to answer uh, quickly. Uh, campaign finance has been a contentious topic between the two campaigns. Um, campaign contributions. I assume you would say that donors would not have an undue influence on you. So why does campaign finance matter? The campaign, the campaign contribution, I don't know that I would agree with one of the, your statements that donors have no influence. I think any politician who says that donors have no influence on them isn't paying attention to their own brain. The campaign contribution is the only financial transaction about which I am aware that after words both parties insist that nothing has changed. Uh, one of the reasons I think we need campaign finance reform is because none of us is perfect, and I've advocated for it in every legislative session that I've had, and I campaigned for publicly financed elections, and I think I'm the only candidate who can say that. Uh, the uh, part of what having some self-imposed limits does is force me to broaden our asking and the good news about that, and it's not that it works that you make, a, you make a call and somebody says, well, I'll give you, actually, it happens sometimes, but I say, I've said no so far every time. So it says, well, I'll help you if you do blank. It's not usually that. You just know what they want you to say before you walk in the room. I mean, you don't need the developers to tell you that they want systems development charge breaks before you go out and get their endorsement and talk to them. You know that's what they want before you talk to them. 
And it just means that you end up spending more of your time talking to people who can give you $1,000. And so one of the reasons we've tried to do and have now done a historic number of house parties, I don't think anybody in the region has ever done more, is because we want to broaden our base of support as broadly as possible. A concern I have remaining is that when, when the other campaign refused to agree to, to reach an agreement on uh, independent expenditures, that it'll just be a shell game where we limit our own contributions, but then sort of shady groups go out and beat the tar out of each other uh, off the books. And I still think we need to address that somehow. Thank you. Okay, Charlie Hale, same question to begin. Um, your assessment of your own character and leadership abilities, your strengths and your weaknesses in relationship to colleagues, to staff, and to the public. Mm. Good question. Uh, my definition of leadership is, uh, is that really there are three strands to it, like a three-stranded rope or that proverbial three-legged stool maybe, and that is courage and clarity and action. And let me explain each of those, and, and I think they fit my strengths and my weaknesses. First, you have to have the courage to propose and do things. Uh, you have to be willing to stick your neck out, and you have to be willing to take the heat. And I've proven that. You may remember uh, building a couple of new community centers wasn't all hearts and flowers. And I perse persevered with that because I think I exercised some of that courage. And we got it done. And we found some of the opponents of those centers inside not long after on the Stairmaster. So, you know, it proves that courage is eventually rewarded. Um, clarity, I think uh, it's really important in public life to speak clearly, and I try to do that. And in fact, it's one of my weaknesses that I sometimes am blunt or am considered to be blunt because I come right out and say it. And I think there's way too much double speak in politics and way too many words in the air without meaning. And so I try to choose my words and have them be real. But sometimes that can be a little jarring, I guess. Uh, and then a propensity to action is probably the most important thing of all. Now, in our weird form of government, you're not an autocrat. In order to get to action, you have to be a collaborative leader. You have to be able to walk down the hall and get to yes with a couple of other people or come over to this building and work out agreement with the county on how we're going to build a bridge or pay for homeless services instead of battling those things out in the headlines. So my style is collaborative, even though I think I embody all three of those traits. Probably my biggest weakness is a, is a tendency to just dive right in and start problem solving. Nancy, my wife, who's here, says I should campaign in a tool belt because I always say, I can fix that. And that's good, but I think I need to remember to set the vision and explain where my heart and head are and then get the tools out and start fixing things. Thank you. Um, to get to the tough questions for you, um, when you served on the city council before, um, you left uh, before your third term was over. What do you say to voters who worry that that might happen again? Well, one, this, uh, one, if I had to do it all over again, I think I would serve the full term and not uh, make that change in our lives that Nancy and I had in mind then. We would postpone a little longer. Uh, but uh, so I think there was reason for some people to be disgruntled that even though I got a lot done in 10 years, you know, wait a minute. But this is the mayor's office. This is the most important office in the city. This is a big personal commitment, life commitment, and public commitment. So if I'm elected, I'll serve my full term. And if I seek a second term, I'll serve that one as well, God willing. And that's in, an important commitment to make, and I'll make it here and anywhere else it's asked. You know, you asked the question about staff. I don't know if you want me to mention that, but in my case, uh, you can ask Mr. Ron Paul, our Ron Paul here in Portland, who's in the room, but also ask people like Bob Wall, who was interviewed in the Oregonian about what it was like to work for me, or Zary Santner, who were my department heads. One of my favorite stories about staff is I was out canvassing, going door to door, and I knocked on Jill Grenda's door. She's a planner who works for the city. And she said, you know, when you were commissioner in charge of my bureau, I had a tough problem that I was working on, a neighborhood plan, and you sent me a personal note saying, thanks for persevering and trying to do good work under fire. And she said, and this is 10 years later, I still have that note. So I think I'm a good boss because I do remember the people that do the work. Um, another uh, concern that voters have expressed is the um, ethics of living in Washington State and voting in Multnomah County, living in Washington State and 
p not paying taxes here, but voting here. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those voters? First, I did pay taxes here because uh, I was working part-time in Oregon. But the situation was a family situation, not a tax strategy. When Nancy and I decided to get married, she was living in Stevenson, Washington. I emphasize that because there's a blogger who keeps calling me Camus Charlie. I've never spent a night in Camus, and I never will. Uh, but Nancy was living in Stevenson with her kids, and our commitment was we would live there in her home that she owned until the kids moved on and then we'd move back to Portland, which was my home. And so I knew it was a temporary absence, and you can vote in your hometown when you're off in college or serving in the military or any other temporary absence. So it was never a stratagem. It was just living our lives and making a commitment to our kids, and I'm really proud that we did it. And to the question of campaign contributions, um, I will repeat what I said to Jefferson Smith, but um, you also can reject the premise if you want. Campaign contributions have been a contentious topic. I assume that you would say that donors do not have an undue influence with you. So why does the question of campaign contributions matter? Because the public is concerned about the influence of big money in politics. And even if we here in Portland, all of us, Jeff, me, everyone else, have been ethical, I think it's important that we respond to that public concern. And that's why our campaign was first to adopt a limit, and we adopted a limit of $600, and contributions only from the state of Oregon. And I'm really proud of setting those limits and uh, trying that approach. Frankly, it makes it a lot harder to campaign because you have to reach a lot more people. Frankly, it makes it a lot better because you have to reach a lot more people. And I'm really proud of the, the size of the donor base and supporter base that we've built for my campaign, in part because we're not letting anyone have what even might appear to be an unreasonable influence. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, we're going to conclude with just a one-minute closing statement from each of you. Um, and we will begin with... Charlie Hales. Great. Well, thanks very much for this opportunity to come together. Um, let me mention a few things that I hope to see if I'm successful in winning this office and the public says you're the guy for the job. I want to see a Portland where we're proud of our city government again, as well as proud of our city. I want to see some significant progress on an agenda that I think we all share. First, that we have a great public school in every neighborhood and all our kids are moving towards success. Uh, I do want to see a local economy that young people can move here and not retire and where hardworking people can find family wage jobs and build a good life here uh, and that we are becoming more prosperous for all. Something we only touched on, I want a transit system that serves the whole community, that gets those workers to work and those kids to school. And I want to see us focusing on basic services like streets and sidewalks and parks. As I said earlier, I'm a fix-it guy. Those are problems that need fixing. I'm ready for the job. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And now, Jefferson Smith. I'll add just a little bit to the staff. <clears throat> I mentioned some of the staff that I've worked with for a long time, some of the staff I no longer work with, have gone on to do things like be the current chief of staff for the mayor. Uh, member of my board is now, I think, chief budget officer for the city. I think we have a chance to put together one of the best teams that this city has seen in the last 30 years. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't be running. And if you don't think that, you shouldn't vote for me. Let me say something deeper about what I think is happening in our city. That if we're gonna change our city, and I believe we need some change, uh, we're going to have to change our politics. And the way you're supposed to run for office is first hire a consultant. Second, they tell you to raise a bunch of big checks for some friends. You can limit your contributions later, but make sure you get a couple $25,000 checks from jump. And then do opposition research and polling to figure out how to tear your opponent to the ground or have surrogates do it. We've got to make sure that we change our politics if we want to change our city. And I'm going to need the help of the League of Women Voters to do that because this conversation has only just begun. Thank you. That ends our candidate forum, and so we'd like to thank both of you for participating and thank Metro East Community Media for recording the forum. Election day is November 6th, ballots mailed October 19th, and they have to be delivered to an official drop-off site no later than 8 p.m. on November 6th. So on behalf of the League of Women Voters, thank you for participating. Thank you all for watching the candidate forum, and remember your vote 
counts. Yeah, thank you.